So hi there, we're here in, uh, in Berlin yeah. with uh, Trunkbird. Uh, Matt, you're one of the co-founders of, of Trunkbird. Exactly. So, uh, what is it? Trunkbird is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for shipping tasks. So if you need to send something, you can find someone who's going that way anyway and they can bring it for you. And then you, of course, pay them to do so. And we take 10% of whatever you pay. And for that, we provide insurance. Okay, that's a clear pitch. Yeah. <laughs> I've done it a few times before. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you started in, in Denmark, but we're, in, but we're now here in, in, in Berlin. So uh, what happened? Well, we started, we started in, uh, in Copenhagen about a year and a half ago. And we were up and running in, in Denmark for around a year. And then we, there was a bunch of different reasons, but we, we kind of just ended up taking the, taking the leap and moving here. Um, obviously, Germany is, is a lot bigger as a market. It's 80 million people, and in Denmark, we're only 5 million people. And with this kind of business model, you really need quite a big market. It has to scale before it will become profitable as a business. Um, so that was one thing, but we also wanted to ex expand our team and make our costs of living lower. Um, both of which is a lot easier in Berlin. Yeah, I can imagine that. And, and uh, how, how did you come up with the idea of Trunk Birds? Um, so it started actually kind of like out of need. Uh, my co-founder Daniel had a, a sports bag of stuff uh, at his parents' house in the other end of Denmark. Uh, and he needed it in Copenhagen and he was looking at, at different ways of getting it to Copenhagen and it was kind of expensive and it was even if you could find prices which is sometimes hard and and you would have to like wrap it very like you had to spend a lot of time on it and it was his parents who would have to do it and yeah so it's, it was just not easy enough it's not a nice user experience uh, and at the same time we were fascinated by the the sharing economy and, and these business models where where people help each other but also um, cut their costs or or make some money um, so yeah, we just kind of put put two and two together and, and started building it. And 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 uh, uh, how did you do that? Because uh, is one of you a developer? No, actually, we uh, we we actually managed to to get some get some investment uh, from an angel investor. With basically, we just had a slide deck uh, <laughs> and a lot of a lot of. Uh, yeah, a lot of ideas and, and a lot of drive uh, to make it happen. And then we got some money and then we could start to, to pay someone for, for developing it. Okay, and, and then what, uh, how did the process go? I mean, those, so that what we started to do was we started with an outsourcing setup uh, where we had some developers in, in Riga. Um, and, and we got the first version of our site, we got it up and running and it was, it was working and it was nice, nice enough. Um, but I think around when we hit 3,500 users, uh, everything just kind of started to to run very slowly um, like the technology that it was built on was not good enough and we were spending too much time and too much resources on outsourcing setup so we decided to to get it uh, like all the tech get it on board the team and that was also one of the reasons why we moved down here to Berlin was that it's it's a lot easier to find developers and when you find them it's a lot easier to pay them the expensive uh, the developers in Denmark are, are quite expensive. So with the same amount of money, uh, you can run for for uh, maybe twice the time. Uh, when yeah, you, I mean, like if, in, you, if, in you, if you add it all together, like like just paying your rent privately, uh, buying food privately, going out for beers, <laughs> if you want to do that, everything in in Berlin like that is just half price, and and we're not we're not like we don't have a cash flow, at, uh, like not a significant cash flow, so we're basically living out of a of a pool of money from, from an investor and we can just stretch that a lot longer uh, by living in a place where it's a lot cheaper. We can pay ourselves less um, and still have actually a better quality of life, which is, I mean, you do need to have some quality of life even though you try to have the whole struggling entrepreneur uh, thing going on, but I mean, you still you still got to pay rent and you still have to enjoy yourself. So. Yeah, and, and um, how did you convince your, the investor because she said, okay, we only had we only had a, had a plan, we, we didn't have anything. Uh, we, uh, did, uh, did you also brought some of your, of your own money? Yeah, okay. we did, we did. But, but we, yeah, some money, but it was, I mean, we probably wouldn't have been able to do it without, without the investor. But so how did you convince the, the investor? I mean, the idea is, is good. 
and it's it's relatively easy to sell. Um, it's it's like a likable idea. You can understand the immediate benefit of it, and at the same time, it's extremely scalable. There's there's no real limit to how big it can get, um, and that of course speaks very nicely to an investor. Um, and we, we had a good team. Uh, we still do have an even better team now. We've expanded the team. Um, I mean, it wasn't easy. It's never easy to convince someone to, to give you a lot of money, um, but but it wasn't impossible. And and we we got some really good investors, and we're bringing some more investors in now who are also some really really cool people. So excited about it. Okay, cool. And and, and how did you manage to 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 really get the first amount of the supply on the platform? Because you said okay, with three with three and a thousand users, it, mm. uh, it it went slow. Mm. But three and a thousand is also quite a lot. Mm. So how did you manage to get the first mm. users on board? I mean, that's the that's the I think for anyone trying to build a marketplace, that's the the number one challenge. This the hen and the egg. Like like, do we start with supply or do we start with demand? And in our case. Demand is people who want to send something, and supply is people who want to take this stuff with them. Um, and that is tricky. Like it's really it's hard. Like when if someone comes to your site and they want to send someone something, and there's no one there to to take it, it's like going to a flea market to buy stuff, and there's no one there selling stuff, and it's just really a bad experience. Um, and and we try to solve this in, in a lot of different ways, but we we had a very pragmatic uh, approach to it, and and. and Pretty soon on, we realized that the most important thing is that supply doesn't fail. Because when people, if people want to, to get something shipped and it doesn't work, they get frustrated. If people want to bring something and there's nothing to bring right at that time when they go to the website, they might they look. Okay, we'll check next time. I'm going somewhere. But if people try to send something and there's no one taking it, then they won't come back. So what we did was we bought a very cheap, shitty old van. And then we just started uh, taking turns between the between the three founders. We every weekend we would drive all over Denmark, uh, and <laughs> you know all about driving shitty old vans. Um, so yeah, we did that. We did that every weekend, um, just to make sure that no one had a, had a bad experience. And that's of course not very scalable. But but this we learned so much about using our own service and meeting the users uh, that we could really help us in our further development of the company. And at the same time, like the people who, when when we came out and said, "Well, I'm actually the founder of this company, and I'm bringing your your stuff here," um, and they were like, "Ah, oh, this is so cool!" And like, really like your idea, and I'm gonna tell all my friends about it and tell them to use it. And so, like, it had a really positive impact. It was a great way to get started. And and yeah, just you just gotta get your hands dirty and, and do the boring stuff that doesn't scale because it's it's a really good way to start. And uh, what were the most valuable lessons you learned by, by driving? A shitty old fan uh, <laughs> across Denmark. Um, bringing bringing lots of coffee um, is important, <laughs> but no, I mean, f- there, there are many like like it's it's hard to say. Like I mean, of course, there's a lot of stuff about like how how the, the fundamental product is, but but I think the most valuable stuff is all the small things that you haven't seen when you're sitting behind your desk. Just something like. It's fine that, that you have to go on the website to get the information that you need, um, but if it's only on the website, then when you're somewhere in the far corner of Denmark and you don't have internet, then you can't get the address or the phone number of the person that you're that you're meeting. So pretty important to send an email to people yeah. with all the information they need, and also the way people like to communicate. We were initially building this as a bidding platform because we thought it was about having as little communication needed as possible. But it turns out that then people just use the comment section as a sort of chat uh, because people just wanted to talk about the task and if they were going to solve it, then they would use the bidding form function just kind of to like settle whatever they had agreed on in the chat. So we, we completely going to change this flow because we, we have to make it the way people want to use it. And, and that's something you only learn if you Try it yourself and talk with your users. Yeah, and 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 how does the process work? Uh, of course, there there are two sides. Let's start with the people who are driving from A to B. Mm-hmm. Let's say uh, I am driving every week from Berlin to Hanover, mm-hmm. just in a, a random example, mm-hmm. and I have space in my trunk mm-hmm. uh, left, and I w- want to share that mm-hmm. and get some extra money. Uh, what do I do? It's very very simple. You go you go to our website and then you say create a route. 
and then you can you can type in what size like how much space do you have uh, not like you don't have to measure your trunk it's just kind of like you just say what could fit in there like, do you have space for a guitar or an elephant like, like we have this like figures and then you say like how often do you go um, and then you can actually also say like how much is your like expectation of price based on, on the size um, and then your route is in the system and then when someone else goes in and creates something we have an algorithm that matches up and says okay here's something that will fit where you like we use google maps and we say okay this will only be a 10 percent or 5 percent detour for this guy so he will probably want to be notified about this task and then you get an email uh, saying now there's a new task that that might be interesting for you and then you can contact the person who wants it moved okay and, and then from the other side the person who wants something to be moved how, how does that how does that, does that, does that uh, mm, works it's pretty much the same you just go into our site and then you have a form you fill out like a task title, where it's going from and to, and say roughly how much it weighs and how big it is, and you can put a picture in if you want, like that's helpful for the, for the driver. Um, so we try to encourage people to do that. Um, and then you basically just like, if they're all, all if, like if my task matches uh, your route, then I can just immediately see, okay, there's one person here who might be interested, so I can contact you. Or otherwise you just wait and then someone will, will contact you. And, and the price? That's settled between between the this, like the person sending the stuff and the person bringing it. Uh, we give like recommendations, uh, but they're pretty rough. Like we don't have that much data, and especially in Germany. Um, so it, it's kind of just like seeing seeing what people will think is fair. And and what is, what is the average distance for for a ride? I think the most common dif distance in, in Denmark, at least, is, is like these 300 kilometers or something. It's Aarhus and Copenhagen, which are the two biggest cities in, in Denmark. That's where we've seen most of our tasks being moved. And is it also because uh, the, the, uh, the thresholds to uh, make a detour, to get on the platform, uh, really also uh, 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 conflicts with, uh, with, okay, how much money do you want? It's the uh, same uh, with Blablacar. Uh, you told me earlier that they got the, the same average uh, distance uh, uh, of people uh, who were taking other people with them. But don't you think when the whole system of, 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 of planning your routes and also, so, so uh, are there ways that, uh, so you can uh, lower the threshold? So it will be easier, uh, there's less ha hassle for people to, mm. uh, to join. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. the distance can be smaller. Yeah, I mean, definitely. We we are, we are trying. We we're focusing on on this like longer distance, and it's it's basically just because the, the margin for us and each task is going to be higher because it's it's more expensive to send something at a further distance. And there's very very many companies uh, trying to solve these last mile things and and like, doing this like instant delivery within the cities. It's a very very crowded space. Um, it's it's not unlikely that we will move into that eventually but but for now we're trying to focus on these more long distance uh, things um, but of course we're trying to do a lot of different stuff to to make it like less of a hassle we're working very hard on these like drop hubs like places where you can go and, and put your stuff and then someone else can pick it up so that you won't need to to meet and like arrange both a time and a place you can just arrange place and then I mean a cafe or or something where you can just leave it and someone picks it up. And, and, and did, did you also did, uh, did some research in, in Denmark uh, from the, from, for, uh, to, to check the motivation factor why people are using your service? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I mean of course it's, like, it's, it's difficult to talk about always because there's like two different sides of the platform. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think one general thing that's becoming more and more obvious for, for everyone in, in these like sharing economy services is that, that saving money or, or at least like not usually it's not about making money um, and with the prices that people get here it will usually not be making money well on some trips but but it's mostly like our idea is that if people are driving anyway they can offer a much better price because they only have to cut costs whereas if someone is professional they have to make a profit and they have to like get the whole cost paid for um, so of course, like the, the money is, is of course a, a big motivator, but, but a lot of people also like to see it because it's, it is more sustainable when someone is driving anyway and has more social value. You like get a face to the person who's going to, to be bringing your stuff. 
uh, and that's especially with fragile uh, stuff. If you're sending some porcelain or something, like looking someone in the eye, and they will say, okay, I'm gonna bring this to, to the other end of the country, instead of having it switch hands five times uh, and go to, to different people all the time. And, and, and I think that that will change when you're going to introduce that uh, drop-off points yeah. where people don't meet again. And also maybe they, they will be this uh, good uh, with a group of others uh, like yeah, you know, yeah. right now because you don't, don't have the that's, physical that's, contact. And that's, one of the, that's one of the, we've discussed this so much, like what, what has greater value? Is it the ease or is it, is it the, the personal contact? Um, and, and yeah, you get, a, you get less of it if we start using these drop ups, which is, which is one of the things that we don't like about it. However, you still have the direct contact you've written uh, with the person directly who's going to be bringing it from end to end. Uh, so you might not meet the person face to face, but you still get a, a personal service. You can call the person, you can, like if there's a problem, you can actually get a hold of the guy and, and you won't have to sit at home between 9 and 17 waiting for your package to be delivered because you just have a direct communication with the person. And that's really one of the things that people hate about traditional shipping. It's yeah. just like, yeah, we're going to be there between 9 and 5. So just take an entire day off and then they show up the day after yeah. when you're not home. I mean, so, so it's, it's, yeah, but it is, there's definitely a trade-off there. And also because you're not really focusing on, on big cities uh, with a distance of, of about 300 miles uh, mm. or uh, uh, kilometers. But in the end, if you want to scale, uh, mm. wouldn't it be even more profitable just like when you have 100 different packages a day mm. going from Berlin to Hanover? Mm. Isn't it much easier to just rent a truck? and be becoming a traditional uh, uh, delivery service. Well, that's, that's the thing, like the, the, the really interesting thing here is that, that every day more air is being moved than actual stuff is being moved. So there's a huge surplus of capacity. And, and even on scale, like, yeah, of course, like it, it, there would be more cost efficient to do it in a truck than do it in 100 cars if you had to pay for these 100 cars. But these 100 cars are already going. Those costs are already there. So it's much more cost efficient because you don't have to, you don't have any like expenses associated with this. So it doesn't matter how much it scales, it will still be, be cheaper. But then uh, a, uh, another extension of your model could be that you also can uh, ask uh, uh, truck drivers who have idle capacity in mm. their uh, uh, truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And, and we see also people who come in and, and create tasks that are a couch uh, or, or all the furniture of an entire apartment. And of course, that's not something that can just be solved by, by private uh, persons. So we're not, we're not focusing very much on it because we're trying to do one thing and do one thing really well. But of course, we don't discourage uh, professional carriers for filling up their empty capacity. Um, because actually, I, I, this, and I don't have any good source for this, so it might seem like a <laughs> number that I'm throwing out there, but, but around 50% of, of the capacity in professional carriers is also vacant, even when they're driving with goods and not just driving empty, because it's just impossible. Like they, they have the best logistics systems available, but there's always going to be like a gap between where stuff needs to go and how big the trucks are and so on. It's never going to be perfect. Yeah. So, so we would really like to also start putting in the bigger stuff from people in these cars. Yeah, yeah, but then uh, you really have to package pretty good, and they, and they got maybe the same problem as you have with the, with the uh, traditional. And that's service. and that's the thing. Like we like people people keep saying that we are the peer to peer uh, model for for parcel delivery, and I'm just always like, no, like parcels are kind of stupid and unnecessary. Like you would never if if I asked you to bring uh, something of mine to Utrecht today. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be like, oh yeah, but I just got to go to the shop and buy a package, a parcel, so I can wrap it really nicely and tape around it and the fluffy things. Like, just like, yeah, I trust you. I mean, you can, you can carry my guitar in your hand and put it in your car. You don't, you don't need a parcel. Yeah. And, and that's another place where we're trying to make it more sustainable because it's just a waste of, of material to have to wrap everything just to protect it from, from the people shipping it. Okay, and uh, uh, yeah, you started in, in Denmark, you're now based in Berlin also because of cost and, 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 and because of people. Um, but, are you all, uh, but are you also going to start in, uh, in, in Germany uh, uh, really soon? 
Yeah, yeah, we are we're actually very close to launching uh, in Germany. We have the site translated and we're just working on the on the last things. There's some, some slight differences like how payment works in, in Denmark compared to Germany. Uh, and we're just like finding the best way to make people feel very comfortable and secure uh, about using our service. And, and, and what are the bigger differences uh, uh, between the Danish and the German markets? I mean, it's like obviously like it's neighboring countries, so they are, in most things, they are quite similar. And, and I think in Germany was one of the first countries to really adopt the whole Mietfahrgelegenheit, uh, like blah blah car, uh, like the ride sharing models. Um, so they're very open to it, but at the same time, Germans, they, they do kind of like their bureaucracy and, and like having everything in a very order, orderly manner and very detailed and very structured. And, and I can tell that this the insurance part, for instance, of, of our service is much more important to, to German people than it is to Danish. It's like a lot of people are very skeptical. And then when, as soon as we mentioned, like, okay, but, but everything that is sent is insured, up to 1,500 euros with no excess. Then people are like, oh, okay, like, like okay, you, you got this under control. Like, it's, it sounds, it sounds reasonable. So they, they have like the formality around everything. Um, and the insurance, uh, are you working together with an insurance company, or do, or do you just have your own insurance and banking accounts? <laughs> we have, we have an insurance partner uh, that we have a very nice deal with. Uh, so it's, it's. Very very simple. Our like the insurance term sheet that we show people is like one page. Uh, keep it very very simple. And the insurance is, is is for every country you're going to enter, or do you have to s- search for another pa- for, for for every partner and uh, 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 for every country a new partner? No, we don't. Like our it's a it's a Danish company, but it's a cover holder of Lloyd's of London, so which is one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. Um, so they they have like competence to do insurance in, in every single country. Um, so yeah, and we, we just talk to them and say, okay, guys, we, we also want to do this in Germany now. And it's just, yeah, sure, like it, it covers. Okay, cool. That's, uh, and and, and how, did you conf- how did you convince them to, uh, to join? Because you say, okay, uh, they're part of a really big company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually an interesting, an interesting point because we, we talked to a lot of insurance companies uh, and, and they were they were like most of them they would look at uh, our business model and then they would look at their what they normally charge for for insurance of shipping and then they would look at the the price they normally give and then they would say okay but this is unprofessional people doing it so we will charge more than that which is our normal but then we finally found one company that looked at a business model and actually understood it and they said okay what do we normally charge for shipping and then okay, but this is someone coming to your door, looking you in the eye and saying, I'm going to bring this door to door. So there's no like swapping and no th- throwing in the bag of a truck. And they said, okay, this is what we normally charge. And for you, we'll charge less per item. And when we found that, it was like, okay, these guys understood it. We're going to work with these guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no question about that. Yeah, that was and, and, and about the taxes, uh, because uh, what I know about Blablacar is they don't have really much trouble uh, with uh, with tax issues because uh, people are not making profits uh, mm. on the right. But you just went to okay, people. Most people are, are not are not making profits, mm. but maybe some of them are. Mm. So, uh, are there some issues with uh, with uh, with tax of other regulations? It's the, it's this it's pretty much the exact same. So like if if you make a profit, as in anything in your life, if you make a profit, then you pay taxes. Um, but if it is cutting your costs of, of your trip and for owning a car and the wear of the car and so on, um, if you're just cutting costs that you have already, then you don't have to pay taxes. And like when I have a company car uh, with fuel cards and my boss pays my car, uh, so, uh, so uh, <laughs> I don't really have any cost of the car, but, but I am making money by using the platform. I mean, that would be the same as, as in blah, blah, car, uh, that, that of course, then you're making a profit. And, and I am not an, an expert on, on how it works with, with a, a company car. Um, if you're not allowed to make money in your company car, then you probably shouldn't do it. You might get in trouble with your boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can, can imagine that would be also a question from your users. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but generally what we do is just like we, we, we can't be experts on every single uh, scenario related to taxes. And especially now that we're operating in different countries. Um, so really, it's it's the user's own responsibility uh, to not cheat on their taxes. 
but but we, what we know is true and what goes for, for all of them is that if you're not making money off it, then you, should, you, are not, you don't have to be worried. Okay, and, and how, how many people are there now working for the company? So we're, we're the four founders, uh, like we were three founders originally, and then we got a four guy, fourth guy on as a founder. And then we have one more developer uh, working full time. We're getting one or two more uh, on within the next couple of months. And then we have two student workers here in, in Berlin and one guy who's kind of just helping out and doing, doing some stuff in his spare time in, in Denmark. Okay, cool. And, and, and you're also now talking to some investors, uh, so you need some money to grow? Yeah. We actually, today, we <laughs> got the transfer uh, of some funds from, from new investors. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, it's a good feeling, it's a good <laughs> feeling. Um, but yeah, we went, we went through a, a second round of, of uh, investment just now um, and getting some really, really cool guys on board. So it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. Cool. And, 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 and what, what is your ambition? Like, let's say, in five years, um, where do you stand then? I mean, by then, by then, we want this to be be something that everyone thinks of whenever they have something they need to ship. It has to be something that pops up in people's mind. We don't we don't want to take over the entire industry. We just want people to always think of it as an option. And if it's if it's something small, if it's something that goes really easily in a parcel, and that doesn't have a great affection value or something for you, it will still probably be cheaper to to send it with traditional stuff. But, but also one thing, I mean, so that's one thing, but also one thing that I'm really excited about getting in, in five years is that, that if you imagine the speed, because right now it has to, like, there has to be a match, it has to, someone takes a little while before someone is actually going the same way as your stuff. So, so maybe it's, it's not the fastest way to get it from A to B. But, but if you look at it in, on scale and where we will be in five years, there's like every minute there's someone going between, for instance, Berlin and Hanover. So you can just, if you could match up with these instantly, this will without a doubt be the fastest way of getting something from A to B and having this real time where you can just get in your car and then see, okay, now I'm going to go to Hanover and then see what needs to be taken and then go right away and pick it up. Um, this is something that will be massively exciting. Yeah, you're also making a, a, a real-time match with your uh, schedule. Exactly. Uh, so you can see, okay, he's now going from A to B. Okay, there's some demands. Mm. Can you do it? Yeah, 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 exactly. And that would be when it kind of be begins to look more like, like Uber, where it's just like on demand. And, and at that point, you can also start imagining that it will be very interesting just within the city. Uh, it will be more like, and you can have bike messengers using it just to, uh, to me because for them now, they're paying a, a pretty big portion of, of what they make to the company that, that runs the, the bike messengers. But we only take 10%, so it would be a much bigger, better deal for them if they could just all be keeping 90% of, of what they make from the work that they are actually the ones doing. Um, but that's <laughs> that might be more than five years ago that we started uh, to go before we were structuring the oh, Maybe six. <laughs> maybe six. Five and a half. <laughs> and of course, there are many startups I in this market because everybody uh, sees the market size and sees opportunity. Mm. In the end, everybody wants to be the leader in the market. So, mm. so what will make it that you will be uh, best in your market and not the other, let's say, 20 uh, <laughs> similar startups who are busy in Europe with these kind of activities? Mm. I mean, we, we're doing like, I think in the end it will, like we, we, I, I had a chance at one point to ask uh, Frederick from, from Blablacar what, what was the biggest driver of growth when, when they were starting out, uh, when they really started growing. And what he said was it was basically the competitors. Like there were 10 other companies just in France doing the same thing, but they had a better product. Uh, so people would try out ride sharing, they would like it. Then they would maybe try a couple of different companies and they would choose the one that had the best product. And that's really what we're going to do. We, we have, with some of the stuff that we're doing under the hood for matching tasks and routes, and some of the stuff that we're doing uh, to, to make the user experience as best as possible, we have like, when I look at the different companies who are doing the same, I think we have a much better, kind of, we have a much more personal and much more likable service. I think that will be extremely important. Okay, so I wish you uh, all luck with that. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the interview. You're welcome. Nice to meet you.